Okay, so thank you very much everybody uh, for coming today. Uh, this is part of our research seminar series at the Centre for the Study of Corruption. And I'm delighted today that we have our Professor of Anti-Corruption Practice, Robert Barrington, who's going to be talking to us about the governance of corruption. Uh, for those of you don't, who don't know Robert, he joined us two years ago uh, at Sussex, but he was previously the head of Transparency International UK. And so also brings that perspective of having been working on the civil society side and campaigning for reforms in uh, corruption and the governance of corruption in the UK. And he's going to be talking today about this very hot topic, uh, how corruption should be governed in the UK. Uh, it's a hot topic partly because of the recent scandals we've been having, which have highlighted how there are some weaknesses in the UK integrity system, but also because uh, there are a number of other reviews going on. In particular, the Committee on Standards in Public Life is doing a, a review of the standards system in the UK at the moment. Uh, so we are really looking forward to hearing from you, Robert. Um, the session will be that Robert speaks first of all for about 25, 30 minutes, and then we'll open up to questions. So if you could just in general be on mute, but do put your cameras on um, if you'd like to. I think it's nice for the speaker to see um, the audience um, and know that there are people there listening, um, but uh, no problem if you can't. Okay, Robert, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Liz, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm going, as Liz said, to be talking about the governance of corruption in the UK. I'm here on campus, and um, I seem to be <coughs> one of the very few people here on campus, certainly in this building. We've just recently had a power cut, so if I disappear in the middle, my apologies. Um, and uh, Liz will say some interesting things in the meanwhile, while I rush around uh, trying to get the battery to work and so on. Um, so what I'm going to do is share my screen and uh, we will um, have a look through a quick presentation, which will last, as Liz said, 25 minutes, half an hour. And um, then um, we'll uh, have a discussion. The first question that I think is facing me here is what does the governance of corruption mean? Is it really a thing? Um, we often hear the term governance uh, in uh, corruption, anti-corruption studies. Uh, this well-known, prestigious, uh, highly rated book by uh, one Dan Huff, Corruption, Anti-Corruption and Governance, actually has it in the title. Um, the World Bank talks about governance uh, being the process by which governments are selected, monitored and replaced, so not really talking much about corruption. Um, and some of the grandees uh, in the anti-corruption literature, uh, Johnson, Rose Ackerman, um, and so on, uh, all talk about governance, uh, but they talk about it in much broader terms uh, than corruption. Uh, so what is the governance of corruption? Well, good governance in the context of corruption studies usually means something along these lines. Is the governance of the country sufficiently strong that corruption can be deterred or controlled? And that seems a very reasonable approach to looking at um, uh, how you might uh, tackle corruption in the country, you look at its overall governance. I think there's a distinction to be drawn between uh, the overall governance of a country, uh, which might uh, have the effect of deterring um, uh, or um, controlling corruption, and the governance of corruption. Because increasingly, uh, states have created or encouraged a very specific anti-corruption apparatus. Uh, and that's a mixture of laws and regulators, regulations, anti-corruption commissions and agencies, law enforcement bodies, civil society, and so on. So there's a whole apparatus uh, of uh, what some people call anti-corruption. Um, and so I think the governance of corruption is about how we govern that apparatus. Uh, I think this breaks down into three sort of inherent areas. Uh, the institutional design. Uh, is the anti-corruption apparatus sufficient or proportionate to that country's unique corruption challenges? Uh, efficacy, um, does the apparatus work? Uh, does it carry out its role or functions effectively? And then the accountability, who's in charge of making sure it all works? So my um, uh, broad take on the governance of corruption is it's different to uh, 
the way in which governance is usually used as a term in anti-corruption studies or corruption studies, but there is this thing, the definition, uh, sorry, the, the governance of corruption. So my working definition would be something like this. Uh, and I'm really keen to have feedback on this um, uh, whole approach, but also this uh, definition. The process or system by which a body or state, body of course could be private, private or public sector, um, ensures that its anti-corruption approach is fit for purpose, including the mechanisms for transparency, independence, oversight and accountability. So that's my working definition of what I mean by the governance of corruption. Well, I want to take a little excursion now into um, environmental governance, because at the um, uh, a long time ago, early in my career, I was running an environmental organization called Earthwatch uh, in Oxford in the early 2000s, late 90s. And um, around that time, there was this, um, this thing springing up that uh, caused a few of us to scratch our heads called environmental governance. Um, and this, uh, if you look at um, what I'm saying about the governance of uh, corruption, actually environmental governance, governance is very similar, um, but uh, in the environmental sphere. And you'll see here that um, there's uh, a whole um, uh, literature and um, uh, uh, analysis available on it. Um, and indeed, the government department, DEFRA, has uh, an environmental governance secretariat, uh, or an interim one, because it's, uh, it's a new thing. So there is this thing called environmental governance, which in my mind is doing uh, for the environment, i.e. Uh, overseeing the way in which a country um, is dealing with its environmental problems, um, what we might think of as a suitable approach for dealing with corruption. And interestingly, um, this is a paper from the UK government um, uh, in March 2020, uh, the environmental governance fact sheet. Um, this is what its environmental governance uh, approach is going to consist of, um, setting long-term targets, uh, legal requirements to meet the targets, uh, government reporting um, on, uh, required to report on the effects of new legislation, holding government to account, people able to complain uh, to, the, to the body that's being set up, and it has an enforcement function. So, you know, this is tantalizing for me. If we took out the word uh, environmental and said anti-corruption governance, how fantastic would it be if the UK had all these things happening? Uh, so the question, of course, is, does it have those things happening? And that's what we'll have a look at uh, next, is how does the UK deal with the anti-corruption uh, parallel to this environmental governance? We also, of course, need to ask what would be appropriate for the UK. Um, but the UK has uh, a set of widely acknowledged uh, environmental problems around air pollution, water pollution, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, and so on. Uh, but what about corruption? Well, immediately, of course, as we'll all know, because we study this subject, uh, you get across, you come across your question of what are we really talking about here? Are we talking about uh, petty bribery, standards in public life, or what TI calls corrupt capital, laundering of the proceeds of corruption? And uh, to look in a bit more detail, what, what's the relationship really between political corruption and standards in public life? Uh, what's the relationship between corruption, fraud and economic crime? So uh, it's clearly pretty complex, but then coming from the environmental movement, uh, this doesn't strike me as much more complex than trying to work out the relationship between climate change and biodiversity and water pollution. Uh, they can all be treated as separate disciplines and separate areas, but you can see also the connectivity between them and deal with them holistically. And then, of course, you've got the question of uh, the organic development of um, the British system. Just to take as an example anti-bribery laws, uh, those of us who are campaigning for the Bribery Act will be very familiar with those dates, 1889, 1906 and 1916, which were the... Uh, the laws under which bribery was previously um, prosecuted, if it was prosecuted at all in the UK. Um, and the 2010 Bribery Act was uh, uh, tidying up and superseding those laws. But it illustrates, I think, that some of this stuff has a long heritage in the UK. So uh, you can't simply come in with a new approach um, uh, and ignore the fact that there's been already a long-standing organic development in lots of these areas.
Well, what would it look like? Good environment, good uh, anti-corruption governance. Um, here's what Louis de Souza uh, had to say in 2010. He, um, uh, as one of the several um, academics who've looked at the uh, subject of anti-corruption agencies, identified what he calls six key features and principles of anti-corruption agencies. They're listed here, and I've highlighted one, the inter-institutional cooperation and networking, because I think that's particularly pertinent in the UK context. Now, D'Souza is very specifically talking about anti-corruption agencies, and the UK doesn't have an anti-corruption agency. But I suppose what I'm suggesting here is um, that the features that he has identified, irrespective of whether you, you're a country which has an ACA or not, you would hope to find in your anti-corruption governance. So I think the question for the UK is um, uh, how much of this is found in its anti-corruption governance uh, and therefore is it fit for purpose? Well, the UK has what it would describe, uh, in fact, um, uh, in UNCAC terms is described as a multi-agency approach. In other words, there isn't a single agency like an anti-corruption agency which has responsibility for uh, the UK's approach to tackling corruption. Um, what I've highlighted in red here um, are three sections of uh, a mapping out that comes from a report given by ICAI, the Independent Commission for Aid Impact. Uh, now, you might think that's a rather um, odd um, body to be giving the most comprehensive map available of the UK's um, approach to tackling corruption. Uh, and indeed, it is an odd body. You, you would expect this might be somewhere, for example, in the UK's national anti-corruption strategy or on the website of the Joint Anti-Corruption Unit, something like that. Uh, but it's not. It's in this slightly obscure report from the Independent Commission for Aid Impact. And that itself um, rather illustrates the point that this is dealt with in the UK in a slightly ad hoc way, that the funding for um, a certain amount of anti-corruption activity in the UK uh, comes from the old Department for International Development, now the FCDO, um, and ICAI is set up to see how effective the funding is of DFID, uh, and uh, it is therefore, um, as part of that, had a look at the UK's approach to tackling corruption and illicit financial flows. Um, notwithstanding that slightly obscure route, um, this is the most comprehensive map you will find of uh, the UK's uh, anti-corruption governance. Um, the fact that it's all neatly squared off and put, to, put in boxes makes it look more, a lot more logical and structured than it is in reality. Uh, if you drill down into the detail, you'll see that there are literally dozens of departments and agencies, each of which has a little bit of responsibility for tackling corruption. And the ones I've highlighted in red are, um, first off, that there's an anti-corruption strategy right at the top, uh, one of four um, uh, perhaps complementary strategies under which corruption is um, tackled. Uh, then the only individual who's in the top half of this, uh, in fact, possibly on the sheet of paper at all, is the anti-corruption champion. And we'll have a look a bit more uh, at that role in a moment. And then cross-cutting all of this, and uh, the only thing that cross-cuts all of them, is a group called JACU, the Joint Anti-Corruption Unit. Uh, so I'll look in turn at each of those, the anti-corruption strategy, the champion, and the Joint Anti-Corruption Unit. First off, the National Anti-Corruption Strategy. Um, I've uh, put a couple of papers up on the CSC website, working papers um, around this issue of uh, the UK's anti-corruption governance. And in researching those, I've um, had great fun going back in detail through Hansard, looking at lots of parliamentary speeches, lots of obscure publications from um, uh, DFID and um, the Ministry of Justice and various other bits of government. Um, and in doing so, I came across this document that when I was at TI, I wasn't aware of and I'd never come across before, which is uh, the UK's first ever, I think, uh, uh, anti-corruption plan or action plan for corruption, combating international corruption, as it says, which was actually published in 2006. Um, and it's uh, uh, one of the bit pages and it's got 12 points on it. Um, so uh, it seems to me very clear that what's happened here is that in 2006, the Blair government was in, in a bit of a panic around the BAE systems case when it was getting a lot of flack, both uh, within the UK and from outside the UK, 
Um, and it had to do some things in a bit of a panic. One of the things it did was uh, create a post of anti-corruption champion, um, which we'll look at in a moment. Uh, and the second or another was um, it created uh, this one and a half, uh, one of the bit, bits of uh, paper. So it could announce in Parliament, as was indeed done, we have a national anti-corruption plan. Um, so uh, this is a, a fascinating document in its own right, partly because you can trace uh, a, a clear line of some activities from here into here in 2014, um, the, the first proper uh, anti-corruption plan, which had 64 different actions uh, for the government. Uh, and from then to 2017, the uh, UK anti-corruption strategy. So for the first time in the UK, a five-year strategy. Uh, so what you see here is a sort of gradual um, uh, maturing of the UK's approach in terms of formal plans, at least, uh, and plan moving into a strategy. Um, what, uh, of course, is the interesting question, what's, what's the, uh, the oversight and delivery apparatus behind this? Well, as part of the UK's multi-agency approach, you'll recall at the top of that piece of um, paper, the chart, we had the government's anti-corruption champion and um, uh, he has his own bit of the government website. Um, what's interesting there is not that it tells you much about what the champion does, but it tells you what he doesn't do. Uh, so <laughs> here's the list of things he doesn't do. Um, he doesn't, he's got nothing to do with people breaking the law um, or allegations about people breaking the law if they're overseas. Um, and uh, in fact, you know, allegations generally go somewhere else. So there's quite a good list of things he doesn't do. Um, and of course that raises the question, what does he do? But also how effective would it be uh, if you broke the law, you know, knew somebody had broken the law and you contacted the police? Well, I can speak from first-hand experience here that in TI occasionally we were contacted by uh, people who had witnessed some case of corruption and uh, we um, uh, would point them to this kind of advice and occasionally people would say, uh, that they had indeed contacted the police, who basically had absolutely no idea uh, what to do with um, their um, uh, the case that they had been uh, putting forward. Uh, this is reflected in another very good working paper we just put up on the CSC website, which is about the prosecution of corruption in the UK. Um, so I'd thoroughly recommend looking at that as well. Uh, so immediately you'll see here there's a bit of a disconnect between uh, what the champion says uh, should be happening, go to the police, and what is happening in reality, read our working paper. So what about this anti-corruption champion? Well, it was established in 2006, really, as a direct response to the BAE systems scandal. Uh, there were actually no terms of reference uh, available. I've, I, I've looked in great detail um, in anywhere there might have been in terms of references, and spoken to the civil servants involved in um, the early years of this post and uh, to my astonishment it is actually true that the first terms of reference were introduced in 2014. It's a personal appointment by the Prime Minister. Um, you remember that one of those um, D'Souza principles uh, was uh, independence so um, that obviously uh, raises a question there. There have been seven anti-corruption champions to date of varying success. Um, when I was at TI, I dealt with uh, all of them, except the very first one, Hilary Benn, um, who um, uh, I, I gather did a pretty good job. Uh, some of the subsequent ones have been worse than hopeless. Um, uh, you know, they were occupying the position um, simply because it was a position that needed to be occupied and did nothing, uh, thus offering the, the government a sort of uh, fig leaf of having a champion, but without um, uh, any result. And what we've also seen is a gradual downgrade in the formal status um, of the champion's role uh, or champion's um, position from being a cabinet level appointment uh, to now a conservative backbencher. Uh, that doesn't mean a conservative backbencher would necessarily do a bad job, but clearly if this is playing in a cabinet level, that's a different order of magnitude in terms of um, clout uh, in, um, uh, within government. So this table summarizes um, those various months of painstaking research through the archives. By the way, I'm, uh, by academic background, I'm a historian. So this was uh, great fun for me. Um, and um, you'll see what we've got here is uh, the changing title of the role, which itself is quite interesting. Uh, the dates in office, uh, other roles that they fulfilled. And you'll see there's a bit of a blank more recently because uh, when they were at cabinet office, they 
uh, cabinet level, they did other things as well. They were usually a secretary of state, um, now no longer, um, and some key achievements. And you'll see uh, uh, John Hutton, now Lord Hutton, um, unclear what his role title was and not known what his key achievements were. This is a polite, um, polite thing in the boxes, I think it's fair to say. Um, one thing I will draw your attention to, you obviously won't uh, get to grips to this table in this uh, short um, uh, few minutes we've got, but this is published in the working papers on the CSC website, um, is the changing role title. So originally the ministerial champion for combating international corruption, uh, this was really critical, um, that the focus was always on international corruption. It was either bad stuff happening overseas, done by other people, or possibly done by British companies, maybe BAE Systems, for example, uh, overseas. Uh, Jack Straw was simply the anti-corruption champion. Penn Clark was back again as the international champion. By the time it came to Matt Hancock, uh, it was the government anti-corruption champion. Um, then the prime minister's anti-corruption champion and the prime minister's. Uh, so more recently, a uh, much more personal uh, affiliation to the Prime Minister, in title at least, um, and the international has been dropped, and that's really uh, important, because one of the big advances that was made in this period by civil society advocacy from uh, 2010 to um, uh, 2015 uh, was the argument that you couldn't simply look at corruption as an overseas problem. It had to be looked at as a UK issue as well, and therefore the anti-corruption champion needed that as part of their formal brief. Here's something on the evolution of the terms of reference. There are two sort of substantive um, places you can see the terms of reference. The first is uh, um, the anti-corruption plan of 2014, which for the first time laid out some terms of reference. And the second, uh, in 2017, there are two places in which there is um, uh, there are terms of reference for the champion. The, the UK's submission to UNCAC, the UNCAC peer review process, uh, and in the anti-corruption strategy. And um, you can identify five key uh, changes um, in that period. They're listed here, I won't go through them. Um, and uh, also uh, one thing that was uh, significantly removed. Uh, so the thing that was removed was accountability. Uh, in 2014, uh, the version said parliamentary and public accountability of the government's performance against the plan. Uh, that is no longer in the uh, champion's terms of reference. Uh, on the other hand, uh, point one up above, you have a remit to challenge and not just to scrutinize. So, you know, that's a, possibly a, a tick there and a minus there. And uh, you'll see here that um, the, uh, the change that I was mentioning that the brief uh, moves from being overseas corruption to domestic corruption as well. So finally, just picking up um, the key things on that um, chart from ICAI uh, was the Joint Anti-Corruption Unit or JACU. Uh, this was set up within the Cabinet Office after the Lochern Summit uh, in uh, G8 Summit in 2013, and it became operational in 2014, the same time as the National Anti-Corruption Plan where it was announced that this unit um, was being set up. Uh, it was originally in the cabinet office, um, which is a good place for cross-cutting units in government to be, because that itself is a cross-cutting governmental department. Um, it was then moved to the home office in 2017, um, and uh, that's um, uh, potentially a bit unfortunate because it means it becomes um, uh, lodged in one very specific department, albeit a department that, um, because of terrorism and organized crime um, has uh, quite a big crossover with corruption in general. And it's always had very small staff numbers. I don't know what the exact number is, but I would uh, be surprised if it's been more than a dozen at any one time. In its smallest days, it's been uh, less than that. So it's a very tiny unit. If you compare um, uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission in Hong Kong with its, um, I don't know, 14, 1500 people, um, uh, this, of course, is by no means comparable to an anti-corruption agency, uh, but it's a very small staff for the one bit of the UK government that is um, designated to tackle the issue of corruption. So who's actually in charge of all this? Well, that's an interesting question. The, the anti-corruption champion, as we've seen, reports to the Prime Minister. The Committee on Standards in Public Life, CSPL, also reports to the Prime Minister. 
Uh, the Advisory Committee on Business Appointments, ACOBA, um, I'm not quite sure who that reports to. It's um, a non-departmental body of the Cabinet Office, so maybe it reports to Michael Gove. Um, uh, and it's sort of slightly unclear if you take the corruption scene in the UK as a whole, uh, although you can answer these questions to um, on some specific areas like uh, uh, large overseas bribery by a corporate, who decides to investigate, prosecute, uh, educate, um, uh, promote compliance systems, instigate preventative measures, that's very uncertain in lots of the areas um, of corruption in the UK. And particularly, again, this is a point uh, uh, picking up on what Tristram Hicks has said in his paper on the prosecution of corruption in the UK, um, who decides to be proactive rather than reactive? And the truth is that uh, as long as your system is effectively dependent on a law enforcement response, um, you're more likely to be reactive rather than proactive because uh, law enforcement depends on people coming to them with problems rather than going out and looking for them. And that's the nature of law enforcement. So it's pretty unclear who's really in charge of um, tackling corruption in the UK, uh, except that it might be the prime minister. Um, and um, uh, given what we've heard recently about conflicts of interest and um, uh, independence and so on, that seems not a very robust place to uh, put your anti-corruption governance. Just reminding you what um, those six uh, features and principles were from D'Souza, um, independence is uh, one of them, and when you're reporting to the Prime Minister, you might not be able to tick that box. The interinstitutional cooperation and networking, well, think how complex that uh, chart was from ICAI, and think um, how likely it is that all of those uh, different bodies are working seamlessly together to tackle the UK's corruption. Uh, some of these others, recruitment and specialization, um, we probably just don't know enough. Uh, the JAPU people I come across are all pretty well informed, um, but they come to JAPU generally not as specialists, but as generalists from the civil service who then phone up on it when they get there. And of course, are rotated out as happens to civil servants from time to time. Um, the wide competence and special powers, well, uh, I don't think we could say that about um, any of the agencies um, in the UK. Special powers, you could say, uh, about the National Crime Agency, for example, with its um, uh, ability to use unexplained wealth orders. Um, but uh, generally, um, this would be a feature of an ACA that probably isn't in the UK's apparatus. Uh, the role of research, um, well, none of these agencies are big on anti-corruption research, I think we can fairly say, except uh, possibly a bit of the Home Office, which does from time to time commission bits of research because the Home Office has a research budget. And durability is an interesting one, that um, there's sort of been a long running discussion in uh, Parliament about um, whether JACU is sufficiently institutionalised um, that it will endure. The Serious Fraud Office, uh, some of you will know, has long had a sword of Damocles hanging over it. Uh, so there is a sense that um, many of these institutions um, don't have a sense of permanence about them, um, which creates its own problems. So is the UK's anti-corruption governance fit for purpose? Well, I think the answer to that must depend on how serious a problem you think corruption is in the UK. How serious is the scale, prevalence, threat and impact of corruption? And the UK's answer ten has tended to be, well, it, you know, it does happen overseas. It's not really a thing that's happening here. And uh, that's reflected in the fact that the anti-corruption champion's title was uh, international champion uh, until quite recently. And so the UK's response has been in proportion to a low perceived threat. One of the questions, therefore, is, is that threat changing or has it indeed changed? Let's just look at some of the alternatives. Um, I think there are four things that could be done in the UK. The first is that you could go all out and establish an anti-corruption agency or an integrity commission. Now you may think that's a bit extreme. It's the kind of thing that um, happens in Hong Kong or Singapore or uh, developing countries. But actually, of course, uh, France has established one relatively recently in the Loi Sapin II. Um, it established the first uh, anti-corruption agency in France. And Australia is now going through a consultation process um, on establishing a federal, so uh, countrywide integrity commission to supplement the ones that already exist at state level uh, and uh, for which a budget has um, already been allocated. Uh, there is also the um, model of going down an independent commissioner route as we have for modern slavery, um, an independent expert with a relatively small staff. So maybe a kind of um, 
uh, a, um, an enhanced anti-corruption champion role, but more independent and taken out of the political sphere. You could, of course, uh, strengthen and close the loopholes in the current system. And um, with uh, the various conversations that are going on around the Committee on Standards in Public Life and uh, the various things that are happening with the Johnson government, there have been lots of suggestions. Um, uh, for example, um, putting a COBRA on a statutory footing um, and giving it some powers rather than just making it advisory. Uh, and indeed, the government has recently published a green paper on procurement, um, and that's an opportunity to close some of those loopholes which have appeared during the COVID procurement, the PPE procurement. You could also do nothing and hope for the best, which is, of course, a very traditional British government approach on difficult issues uh, until you get a disaster. Uh, so, you know, what I would emphasize with all of these things is um, uh, whichever one of these you do, and there are examples of all of them working in different contexts and all of them failing in different contexts, really depends on how severe you think the threat is. Which is my ultimate conclusion here. Um, I think we don't, uh, in the UK at the moment, meet those six D'Souza tests. Um, I think the system's insufficiently robust to prevent or address an increase in corruption. Uh, so maybe you don't think there's a problem um, uh, and the current system is OK, but if you think there may be or there is an increase in corruption, uh, the system is, in my view, insufficiently robust. And of course, there are available alternatives. So I think, you know, so three big questions that are really there to address. Um, can you address all those different types of corruption in the same approach uh, from petty bribery right through to um, corrupt capital? What is the scale of the threat? Uh, and uh, does it need tweaks or reform? And then questions for you. Um, I'm really keen uh, to have any feedback you've got on the thoughts I've presented here. Is there such a thing of the governance of corruption or have I just made that up? Um, are there any missing definitions you're aware of that I could usefully incorporate here? Uh, is there any missing evidence for the UK that I've overlooked? And uh, have I reached the right conclusion from putting all this in the pot and seeing what comes out. Okay, thank you, Liz, and over to the Q&A. Fantastic, thanks, Robert. That was really fascinating. And um, yeah, really welcome your um, open approach to that there are some questions for us as well as you being willing to take questions. So uh, if anybody would like to either ask a question or respond to Robert's questions at the end there, um, if you could raise your hand, um, which you can do using the reactions button at the bottom of your screen or alternatively if you can't do that if you just type your name in the chat and um and i will then come to you um or if you'd like to ask a question but you're feeling shy then you can also just type your question in the chat and i'll read it out um so please um start thinking about your questions i'm looking out for those raised hands in the meantime i wonder if i could ask a couple of questions um robert I guess I was quite intrigued by that move from the international framing to the domestic framing. And I just wondered if you knew any more about how that change came about and just sort of how, in a way, how deliberate it was. Um, you, know, you could also imagine that it was just a, a bit of an accident in how it was written down or something. Um, and I guess as sort of evidence around how deliberate it was, I wondered if the change in title was complemented by any notable change in powers or resources or the kind of institutional support um, for the role of the champion. Thank you, Liz. Um, I mean, in my view, it was very deliberate. Whether or not it's now remembered as having been deliberate is a different question, but um, there was no doubt that um, in the early days when we were engaging uh, people like Jack Straw on this issue, he was only interested in getting in place a bribery act uh, because that was what the government needed to do um, to, to you know, get the OECD off our backs effectively. Um, so there was no interest or intent to tackle domestic corruption. TI published in 2011 a report on corruption in the UK, um, and in around 2013, um, the, the TI Global Corruption Barometer um, came out with a stat that 5% of people through an opinion poll in the UK were saying that um, uh, they had experienced bribery. 
Now, they weren't asked had they experienced it in the UK or outside the UK, but um, uh, TI was able to take that 5% figure to the government. And it was the first time it had ever been over 5%. And the, the clever stats people in Berlin always told us that if it's below 5%, ignore it. Uh, but if it gets to 5% or above, then it becomes meaningful. Um, so um, we, uh, we had those sort of two things we could talk to government about. And then TI also launched this campaign on what we called corrupt capital, which was um, around the, um, the laundering of overseas money through the UK and the fact that UK banks, lawyers, accountants, estate agents were complicit in that. So there was a sort of body of stuff that was accumulating. I, I actually think um, one of the things that really made a difference was when Eric Pickles became the anti-corruption champion. Um, he had been in the Department of Local Government and he had seen quite a lot of stuff going on at local authority level, um, which he was never particularly prepared to admit, but he knew perfectly well it was going on. So it was much more logical to him than I think somebody like Jack Straw um, that uh, there was a, a UK problem that could rightfully be addressed. Um, T.I. hammered home this message, you know, every single time we met um, uh, the champion and particularly Eric Pickles, who, who was the most open of the champions for meeting. Um, we'd meet him very regularly. Um, we always hammered home this message and uh, then it was, um, it came into the title. So, um, you know, I think um, it was very deliberate. At the same time in JACU, the Joint Anti-Corruption Unit, um, uh, we saw then, there wasn't a, a change in resourcing, but we definitely saw a change in attitude in which um, there was an acknowledgement that domestic corruption was part of, part of what they dealt with. If you look likewise at those three documents, the Anti-Corruption Plan from 2006, the 2014 and the 2017 strategy, you'll see um, quite a change in the attitude towards uh, the threat posed by domestic corruption. By 2017, it becomes very closely linked to uh, organized crime and national security. So it's being seen through an economic crime lens, um, but um, you know, it's very much seen as a domestic threat as well as an international threat. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, and we have a couple of hands raised now. So I'm going to go first to Juliet. I thank you, um, Liz, and thank you, uh, Robert, for the presentation, an excellent one. I just wanted to add my voice to some of the things you've highlighted. One to say um, whether it should be a governance of anti-corruption or whether it should be governance of corruption, because I'm looking at the topic and I'm wondering what are we governing here? Uh, but um, at the end of the day, you set out the principles, and I think that is really what matters. Um, but um, I just wanted to add that Eric Pickles, somebody I've had the honor of meeting once, um, seems to have really championed uh, some of those things that uh, UK wanted to do. Because I recall that in 2016, the anti-corruption summit uh, led to a slew of actions, both domestically in the UK, as well as internationally. Although that, that uh, summit was led by camera, but I think behind the scene, Eric did a whole lot of work to get attention, I think, not just on international anti-corruption efforts and the threat it had on so many developing countries, but also within the UK as well. I, I believe that is what led to the 2017 strategy because it, it really raised the uh, but in terms of what is happening domestically and what is happening internationally in terms of uh, issues around beneficial ownership. And as you mentioned, laundering of the process of crime. Uh, from where I come from in Nigeria, our interest is largely about how we work with UK, for example, to ensure that we limit the movement of funds, process of crime, launder funds into the UK financial system. But how do we make sure also and how would you get the UK to respond to, because it's going to be a two-way thing. While we are trying to prevent from our own end, we also expect that the UK government should be doing quite a lot to ensure that financial system uh, remains um, attuned with international laws. And of course, that there are not domestic laws to deal with all those issues. And so for me, I think maybe one of the areas I was hoping you would point to uh, very actively is the way uh, you know, developing countries would perceive uh, what is happening in the UK in terms of the UK's ability to deal with issues related to 
financial system integrity, something that OECD and the, the Financial Action Task Force is very keen uh, to rein in. And I believe that the TI UK is in fact, you know, a lot of work, I've seen a lot of publications around uh, the financial system. In fact, there is one called, uh, I think it's called TIP, TIP, something like that. But we do have experience that the financial system in the UK is still very weak. Uh, that's my own view, something we need to look at very actively. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juliet. Robert, over to yeah. you. Thank you. I mean, you know, I, I agree with pretty much everything Juliet said there. It, it also reminds me of one other feature to this, which is very important. Um, it's relevant to that very small staff size at Jakku, which is the resourcing that goes in. Um, and um, you know, to some extent that plays into that sixth of D'Souza's um, principles on durability. Um, the amount of money that goes in is very small. The SFO um, has uh, had its budget um, uh, cut, you know, quite substantially for years. Um, the, uh, the National Crime Agency's division that's meant to deal with this stuff has a very small budget each year and it's in the very low millions. Um, and they find themselves easily outgunned by um, oligarchs and kleptocrats who have uh, many billions at their disposal to pay uh, top London lawyers. So, you know, the, the UK is outgunned um, in this, or the, the UK anti-corruption effort is outgunned. Um, and uh, where you put the budget is, of course, a matter of political will at the end of the day. Um, so uh, I think it's fair to say that the political will hasn't been there to fund this stuff properly. Thank you. Yeah, that all important question of actually Thank having you the very capacity. Much. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to Ian next. Uh, yeah, so uh, what the actual line of work I'm in is in management systems normally, and I audit companies for management systems, which is basically governance. So I was taken by your working definition, Robert, uh, and I think this is really part of what Juliet said and yourself in her question there. What I, what I would actually add to your uh, your def your working de definition is the word effective. So your your definition, working definition, I think is excellent. Uh, the process or systems by which a body or state ensures its anti-corruption approach is fit for purpose, including the mechanisms. I would just add in, uh, it's fit for purpose and effective. Uh, I've I, I've gone to lots of organisations, read their management system, and gone, wow, this is fantastic, only to find it's not that effective. And I'd argue that you could look at the British, the UK. Uh, anti-corruption uh, strategy and do a gap analysis and work out that it looks fit for purpose but how effective it is is probably the big question uh if that makes sense uh Thank so you. it's, not, it's not, not so much a question as 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 an inclusion uh, when you mentioned about your working uh piece there so there you go any any thoughts on that robert is it effective yeah no great great point and it's now in there um, <laughs> I will add it forthwith. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, you know, the truth is that um, our, our system at the moment isn't all that effective. And I think when you look at the, um, the number and result of uh, prosecutions, if prosecution were, were going to be your measure, um, it's clearly pretty low. The use of unexplained wealth orders um, is much, much lower than expected. Um, so uh, I think um, uh, the current system isn't uh, particularly effective. Um, it's not useless, but it's not as effective as it should be. Um, and uh, so that's a great thing to include in the definition. Thanks, Ian. Great. So do keep your questions coming in. Again, you can raise your hand or write them in the chat, but I'll abuse my position while we have a, a gap in raised hands. Um, I really liked your comparison, Robert, with environmental governance at the beginning. I just wondered, are there any parallels um, from that, anything else we can learn, particularly, again, you talked about the shift from international to domestic framing, but is there anything else we can learn in terms of how to get people to take this seriously as an issue that impacts the UK? I need to think harder about that, actually, Liz. You know, I, I think um, the more I look at the environmental movement and the time I spent there and that before moving across to the anti-corruption sphere, the, you know, the more I see there are tremendous sort of parallels one can look at. I think there's a lot to draw. One of them, this is completely a different subject, but I think it's, it's interesting to note, is the environmental movement are very good at sort of celebrating small successes 
um, and don't go around thinking that they're failures the whole time. Whereas people in the anti-corruption movement seem to wander around permanently depressed that everything's failing, that they're failures, that you know any anti-corruption intervention is failing, and so on. And um, I just, you know, it, it always really strikes me that difference in approach and attitude from the environmental movement to the anti-corruption movement. Um, so, you know, I think that there is a lot there about the expectations those of us in the anti-corruption movement have about what success looks like. And um, uh, TI, of course, um, uh, have as one of their strap lines the or aspirations, um, uh, the eradication of corruption or elimination of corruption, which we all know, of course, is impossible, just as it's impossible to um, uh, restore biodiversity to was it, what it was in 1650. Um, but, um, you know, small successes like um, a small increase in the butterfly population in Devon uh, for three months in 2018 would be hugely su successful for the environmental movement, but um, that wouldn't be considered so by the anti-corruption movement. Great. Yeah, actually, no, I think, yeah, that could be an interesting conversation to have actually around the parallels. I was also thinking about, you know, talking about victims and the sort of scale of the challenge and... Yeah, so lots of things potentially there. Um, we've got a question in the chat from Jerry. Um, he says, Robert, is it your view that we should have an overall anti-corruption agency rather than this piecemeal approach? Oh, and in fact, from Debbie, building on that idea, should an overall agency be independent from government? Great. Well, I'm to take the second question first. The D'Souza principles um, suggest that independence is critical for a successful anti-corruption uh, agency. So I think it would have to be independent from government um, in the way that, you know, um, uh, that proposed environmental um, agency was going to be or will be independent from government. Um, ultimately, of course, these things all depend on their um, resourcing. Uh, from government and um, uh, their license to operate um, comes from legislation. So government can change that, but I think independence is critical. Um, whether we need an anti-corruption agency, as I said, you know, I think this depends on what we think the threat is in the UK. How severe is corruption in the UK? Uh, my view on this is, um, first off, we just don't know enough about corruption in the UK to know what the scale of the threat is. Um, but I have a, a very strong sense that it has been underestimated by the UK government for uh, a long period because there has been a huge sense of complacency. Um, you know, we've seen this certainly around the corrupt capital uh, side of things where uh, it's become, you know, provable that um, uh, dirty funds are moving through London and not enough was done for long enough. And in fact, in many ways, for example, with the use of golden visas, um, the UK government encouraged that to happen rather than discouraged it. So um, certainly in that space, I think one can say um, the response was uh, inadequate. I suspect it's, um, uh, you know, if you were to really do a deeper dive into petty bribery in the UK and how that affects people's lives, particularly those at the social margins uh, in immigrant populations, in social housing and so on, I suspect you would find a lot more uh, than you're finding, than, than is acknowledged to exist at the moment. Um, certainly, you know, I've been looking at prisons recently, and there's no doubt that it's, you know, pretty prevalent in prisons um, in different ways. Uh, of course, a lot of that about uh, getting contraband into prisons. So um, I think um, uh, for me, the scale of the threat has been underestimated. Uh, I, I think, you know, probably um, uh, I would, I, I wouldn't, I'm not yet ready to pin my colors to the mask of an anti-corruption agency, but I, I would say it needs a really proper thorough examination, both as to what the level of threat is, how that might increase, and what a sensible institutional response would be. Um, it, I would at least go down the, um, uh, the route of saying we, we need reforms, not tweaks. So we need something more substantial, because I think this sort of organic system that's developed since the 19th century is now on its last legs. And it's been propped up a bit by having Jacku and the anti-corruption champion. But I think that's, you know, that that's a relic of another age. And I think we need something more substantial. Great. Um, so we've got another question in the chat and also Sam has his hand up. So the question in the chat is from Gustavo. He says, Robert, do you think soft law approaches are effective to counter corruption in the UK context? Yeah, I mean, 
you know, I'm going to do some classic fence sitting here. Of course, you need both approaches. You need the hard law approaches and the soft law. Um, what's interesting to me about the hard law approaches is actually how little they are enforced at the moment. Um, so, you know, I suspect we could get a lot further with the hard law approaches. Um, uh, again, look at that, you know, working paper on the CSC website, but, um, you know, even beyond that, there's the enforcement gaps all over the place in uh, money laundering and standards in public life and so on. Um, and then on the soft law approaches, you know, um, I think the work that the Committee on Standards in Public Life is, is doing at the moment will be really fascinating as the extent to which they conclude this is a sort of um, cultural soft law nudge norms type approach um, that you need in Parliament and in government and the public service, you know, maybe reinforcing the public service ethos um, and perhaps spreading that to the private sector where the private sector is now delivering public services. Um, and uh, the extent to which you need some harder law. If a minister breaks the ministerial code, when do they go to jail? When do they get fined? You know, those kind of things. Uh, so, you know, I think you need a mixture of both. I think we're doing, we've, we've got lots of the hard law in place, but we're not enforcing it. Um, and I certainly think it needs absolute reinforcement with the, the cultural side. Of course, the thing about the cultural, the norms, the nudging side of things, it requires leadership. Uh, and if we're looking um, at, uh, to the current government to provide the leadership they themselves are the people who seems to be seem to be pushing in the opposite direction uh, so um, i think you're therefore more reliant on hard law than you would be uh, with a government that is um, uh, in, in tune with the kind of norms one would hope for great uh, sam over to you great thanks very much um, and thanks very much for that robert that was that was brilliant um, or is continuing to be, I suppose. Um, I, my question is, so, so you keep on talking about understanding the scale of the challenge. Um, and my question, I suppose, is why do we need to know the scale, what the scale of the challenge is before we implement effective systems or put effective systems in place? Um, is it not that we can tweak the systems and think about what an ideal system ought to look like pre sort of working out, oh, well, you know, this is going on, that's going on. Is it, is it really all that important what's going on as much as designing systems that work to prevent those in the event that they might happen? Yeah, so I think it's a matter of um, political reality that um, I think you're not likely to get a substantial reform unless you can... Um, produce evidence that the reform is required. I think if you're going to say, well, it's possible the UK will have a greater corruption problem in the future, and this is what we need to do to head that off, you're actually not likely to win that argument politically. You're not going to get the legislation through and the resources allocated. I think if you can say, you know, look, this has been happening under our noses and we weren't aware of it, but now we know, and this is what a suitable response would be, you're far more likely to um, uh, to get progress. So, you know, to, to me, your, your approach would be entirely rational, um, but dealing with the government, which has many other priorities, COVID, Brexit, um, uh, decorating flats, uh, all those kind of things, um, uh, you've got to have a pretty convincing evidence-based argument to get the change. I thought you were gonna say dealing with the government that's irrational then, but uh, I'll... <laughs> Um, I just want to have a quick plug for an event we're doing later this week. So on Wednesday, on the 12th, we've got a, a session which will look at what's what's happened in the five years since the London Anti-Corruption Summit in 2016. Uh, George is going to put the link in the chat. And if you have a look on our um, Twitter, um, then you'll, you'll find that there's um, plenty of information about that. But we've got some really good speakers with different perspectives on what it was like to be involved in the summit planning and organization at the time and and what the sort of perspective looks like five years on what have we achieved and, and what haven't we achieved so so do come along to that two o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, Juliet you have your hand raised but I'm not sure if it's an old hand or a new hand. Yeah it's new just a follow up to the discussion around uh, independence of anti-corruption institutions um, something that don't exist in reality. I just wanted that we um, uh, just come to the reality that it's difficult to happen, even with um, countries where you have a clear legislation that says independent corrupt practices commission, um, as we have in Nigeria. 
Um, independence, in my view, it depends on the political context because um, there is is almost difficult to find that an agency or institution of that nature can exist outside of the overall government framework. It, it must report to somebody. And if the person, the agency is reporting to is the president or a minister, minister level or supervisor, um, the extent of independence will depend on the understanding of the supervisor. If the supervisor understands that independence exists in law and must also exist in reality, then it may work. But the truth of the matter is that it, it hardly exists if we're looking to have in a body that is above the uh, parliament or the presidency, it's, it's never going to happen. But we can only hope to the type of reforms and norms uh, that Michael uh, Johnston talked about and uh, Ackerman really emphasized on is about how do we ensure that the political context understands the type of corruption and we begin to build our reforms around those, you know, uh, those issues and the types of corruption exist in a particular country. That's just what I wanted to add to that discussion. Thanks, Juliet. Um, Robert, any final words on you know, what does independence really mean in practice or anything, any other thoughts you'd like to leave us with as we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I'll deal very specifically with the independence point. There, there are models in the UK, I think, for um, independent agencies and independent bodies. Uh, the Information Commissioner, for example. Um, what's interesting is that um, this government has politicised the public appointments process very quickly, much more than it has been really for the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, uh, you know, these things are cyclical. I think it has been politicised in the past. It went through a period of being less so, and now it's uh, quite politicised to the extent that um, appointments to the boards of um, uh, places like the Charity Commission and some of our major museums um, uh, are um, now more or less political appointments. So um, uh, that is definitely something to watch out for. But I guess the ultimate point I'd make is that this isn't simply about what might you set up as an ideal system. It's also about uh, is the current system fit for purpose? And the truth is that a, a system which basically reports to the prime minister uh, is um, directly to the prime minister, you know, not as an arm's length body, um, is almost certainly not fit for purpose. Uh, so I think we could do better. Fantastic. So just leaves it to me then to close. Thank you all so much for coming. It's great to see lots of former and current students here as well as lots of uh, colleagues in the field. Um, so really good discussion. Thank you very much, Robert. Very provocative and interesting. And uh, we hope to see you all at future events. Thank you.